Linux isn't just an operating system, it's a rebellion. It stands against surveillance, closed source ecosystems, and corporate manipulation. But here is the hard truth. Not all Linux distros are as free as you think. If you're switching from Linux to escape big tech, you need to know what's really under the hood. Who writes the codes, who makes the decisions, and who funds the infrastructure. So today I'm going to be revealing who really owns your Linux distro and whether you're joining a community or stepping into another controlled environment. Because if you're going open source, you deserve to do it the right way, well informed. But before we get to it, please hit the like button so that this video reaches as many people as possible. And in the comments, drop the name of your distro. Let's see which one gets the most likes and rises to the top. That might just reveal where the strongest community really lives. Let's get to it. I'm starting off with Fedora. This one looks like a community powered playground, but beneath the surface, it's Red Hat's testing ground. And Red Hat is now a $34 billion piece of IBM. Fedora launched in 2003 as the upstream distro for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And Red Hat still foots the bills for everything. Servers, engineers, infrastructure, legal, just name it. If Red Hat changes direction, Fedora follows. Just look at what happened to CentOS when it was restructured into CentOS Stream, despite community backlash. Fedora's leadership includes elected bodies like the Fedora Council and FESCO, which is the engineering committee. But there's a catch. The Fedora project leader, always a Red Hat employee, has the final say in any deadlock. And Red Hat engineers dominate the candidate pool. Every contributor also signs the FPCA, which allows Red Hat to relicense any submitted code. And this is a key reason why Fedora features flow directly into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And yes, in Fedora, you can participate, you can vote, you can propose changes, even run for leadership roles. But the truth is simple. You're playing on Red Hat's field. Now, if you believe community control should never come with a corporate body override, then Fedora is not for you. You simply do not own this distro. Let's keep it moving. We go to Manjaro and this one sells itself as Ash Made Easy. But behind the slick packaging is a private company. Manjaro GmbH. It was formed in 2019 to turn the project into a business. Now you see that shift, it brought salaries, hardware deals and commercial decisions. So for instance, in 2019, Softmaker Free Office quietly replaced LibreOffice. Not because of a community vote, but because of a partnership deal. Now this deal sparked backlash and it brought a lot of, it raised a lot of questions about who's really in charge. Most of the core devs now draw a paycheck from the company. Community contributions still matter, especially for unofficial community editions. But flagship releases, release cycles, and branding and our boardroom level decisions. Profit and legal strategy come first. Infrastructure is another wide cut. Manjaro uses mirrors from AWS, CDN77, and even Avan Cloud, an Iranian provider once linked to state censorship. It stayed online because it was fast and cheap. And that tells you where priorities lie. You can still contribute, test, discuss, but remember, you're advising a company not steering the ship. It's great because it offers arch power without the complexity, and you will love it if you don't mind a company at the helm. But if you want community first governance, then this one is not for you. You do not own this distro. Now let's talk about Debian. This one is often tagged the democratic Linux distro. There is no company, there is no CEO, no corporate backing. It's entirely run by volunteers, governed by a constitution, and powered by a voting system where major decisions require a super majority. Every year, developers elect a Debian project leader, unpaid with limited power, but fully accountable. When there is a dispute, an elected technical committee steps in. Every major move 
policy shifts, foundational changes goes through community consensus. Funding comes mostly from sponsors like universities and hosting providers, and the project has nearly $500,000 in reserve. But Debian has a strict policy, no full-time hires, and this is done to keep corporate influence at bay. That means development can be slow but free from financial strings. Your voice absolutely matters here. But only if you show up, join the mailing lists, propose changes, and cast your votes. Let's move on to the next. Elementary OS is sleek, it's elegant, and often called the Mac OS of Linux. But beyond the great UI lies a very different kind of structure, or rather a lack of it. The entire project is run by Elementary Inc., a tiny U.S. company now hemmed solely by Daniel Furey after her co-founder stepped away in 2022. There's no founder, no community council, no election process. Volunteers contribute code and apps, but every major decision, features, philosophy, infrastructure comes down to one person. This means consistency and focus, but also it's a bottleneck. The distro runs on a pay-what-you-want model, and while the default download price is $10, you're free to download it for free. This makes funding very light. Daniel relies on community donations, code bounties, and volunteer support to keep the project alive. For this distro, you can contribute, you can suggest, you can support, but you don't vote, you trust. Since there is no shared governance and the community will always bend to the will of one person, this is another distro you do not really own. Let's keep it going. Arch is the ultimate DIY distro. No company, no flashy PR, just code, community, and raw control. But behind this freedom is a structure that most users never see. The distro is governed by volunteers, at the top, there is a project leader, elected every two years by core devs, who only steps in when consensus breaks. Day-to-day -day decisions are made by developers and trusted users who keep Pac-Man, the repos, and tooling running. Funding comes from donations managed by a non-profit in Germany. But it's not just all grassroots. Valve, the company behind Steam, helps fund Arch's infrastructure. And in 2023, Germany's sovereign tech funds injected half a million euros to monetize its packaging tools, leading to part-time paid devs for the first time. That's great for progress, but it also changes the vibe. Sponsorships now matter and policies are being drafted to manage influence. So power isn't just about code anymore. Still, Arch remains one of the most transparent projects out there. You have a say in shaping it, you just have to submit a package to the AUR, apply as a trusted user, or hop into a dev discussion. You won't find a boardroom or a corporate filter, just merit and momentum. Let's keep it going. Ubuntu is next and it's the smiling face of Linux. But behind its orange glow is a corporate engine, Canonical Limited, a private UK limited company founded by Mark Shuttleworth, who still runs the show. There is a community council and a technical board, but both are appointed by Shuttleworth himself. So while feedback is welcome, decisions flow top down. If you want a say in Ubuntu's future, you have to do it from the sidelines. Canonical funds everything, developers, servers, infrastructure, just everything. In return, it steers the ship. And that ship sails with some heavy corporate partners. Microsoft, Google, Dell, Amazon, IBM, you name it. These deals keep Ubuntu strong in the cloud, but also shape its priorities in ways the average desktop user doesn't control. Here are examples. In 2012, Ubuntu included Amazon search results in the local desktop search, sending keystrokes to third parties. The backlash was huge. More recently, ads for Ubuntu Pro started popping up in your terminal when installing packages. Now, you see, these moves aren't bugs, they are business. 
Canonical also owns the Ubuntu trademark and has enforced it even against critics. And while anyone can submit patches, there is no election, no vote, no roadmap you help shape. You get exactly what Canonical gives. This is another distro that you do not own. Next is MX Linux and this one might look like a side project. But it's quietly one of the most downloaded Linux distros on the planet. It was born as a collaboration between the Anti-X and the Mepis communities. MX is run by long-term volunteers like Dolphin underscore Oracle, Jerry3904 and no executive titles, just usernames in a forum building a distro because they want to. There is no corporate sponsor keeping the lights on. Funding comes from donations. PayPal, tips, and GitHub sponsors. It's lean, it's honest, and fiercely independent. But with that freedom comes some fragility, and there is no safety net if the devs burn out. MX mirrors are hosted by small ISPs, universities, and community donors. You wouldn't find a Google CDN or Amazon pipeline behind your updates. That's part of the charm, but it also means that downloads may be slower or patchy in some regions. On this distro, your voice actually matters. If you submit a helpful idea on the forum, it might land in the next ISO. There are no contributor license agreements, no corporate red tapes, no boardroom veto, just real collaboration with real results. This is a distro that you actually own. Now, let's talk about Linux Mint. This is a distro that many new users fall in love with. But behind the nice UI is a very simple structure. One man, one vision. Mint is led by its founder, simply known as Clem. There is no foundation, no board, no voting system. Clem makes the final call, and a small, tight-knit dev team helps bring the roadmap to life. That model has some advantages, fast decisions, a consistent user experience, and no red tape. But it also means you don't really get a say. You can suggest, you can contribute, but there is no vote. If Clem agrees, it happens. If he doesn't, it doesn't. Mint is funded by donations and sponsorships. Monthly revenue reports are public, which adds transparency, but not accountability. In 2015, Mint quietly bundled a VPN app from its major sponsor, Private Internet Access. Clem insisted there was no pressure, but with no oversight body, it comes down to trust. And that's the reoccurring theme with Mint. You have to trust the captain. Their infrastructure also leans on community mirrors and sponsor supports. It's efficient but fragile. If a sponsor pulls out or a host disappears, the project could fill it quickly. So you really do not own this distro and your voice may not count or shape the direction in any way. Okay, let's talk about Pop OS. This one is sleek, it's fast, and it ships with its own Rust-based cosmic desktop that's as modern as it can be. But this distro was not built by a grassroots community. It was built by System76, a hardware company with a mission to sell computers. That's not a knock. Pop OS runs like a dream on System76 machines. The integration is tight, the vision is clear, and they innovate fast because they own the entire stack. Kernel tweaks, drivers, the desktop environment, it's all in-house. But the trade-off is that you don't get a say. There's no council, no election, and no foundation. If you're not a customer, you might feel like a passenger. You can make feature requests, but there are no votes on what is implemented. System76 listens, but they stay. They've also shown that they're not afraid to break from the Linux head. When tensions rose over rust in the kernel, one of their devs quit upstream work altogether. Calling maintainers patronizing pedantic megalomaniacs. That's a sign that System76 will go solo if the mission requires it. PopOS is funded by hardware sales, not donations or sponsors. That means no Google money, no Red Hat grants, but also no external leash. Still, every design decision ultimately serves one goal making System76 devices shine. This distro owns you and not the other way around. 
The last one we explore is Zorin OS. It's clean, fast, and it's built for Windows switchers. This one runs on Ubuntu LTS under the hood. Behind the curtain is a private company, Zorin Group, founded by two brothers in Ireland. Since 2009, they've stirred the distro with a business mindset. There is a free core edition for the masses, but their real revenue comes from Zorin OS Pro, a paid version with extra apps, themes, and support. The business model brings polish, but also limits your power. There is no community governance, no foundation, no public roadmap votes. You can suggest features, file bugs, and give feedback, but decisions are made and stay behind closed doors. To their credit, Zorin does not take cash from big cloud players or hardware giants. No ads, no bundled sponsorware. It's clean, but also lean. Fewer resources mean that innovation happens on their terms and their timeline. And why Zorin inherits a lot from Ubuntu? That also means it inherits canonical choices and limitations. Snaps, telemetry toggles, release pacing, you name it. You're riding shotgun to two companies, not one. You do not own this distro. And if you're after open governance, a real say, or full community control of your operating system, stay clear of Zorin OS. So with all this said, do you own your Linux distro? Well, now I guess you know the answer. Some distros hand you the keys, others keep you in the passenger seat. Open source doesn't always mean open governance. In the end, the distro you choose depends on what freedom means to you. Control, customization, or contribution. Drop a comment below. What distro are you using right now? And do you feel like you own it? And if you are just coming from Windows, you should check out my Linux tier list video where I explain and expose what Linux distros are best for you. I hope you've loved this one. Till the next one, stay safe out there.